out there. <laughs> uh, let's pray. We're in chapter 17 of John as we're going verse by verse. It's a really um, a wonderful portion of scripture. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace, Lord, and we do look um, for your glory, Lord, to fall. Lord, we want to see you in all your glory, all the things that you've done for us. Let them come forth, Lord, this morning as we go through your word, your love for us, your grace that's freely offered, Lord, and the magnificence of, of, of who you are, creator, God, redeemer, savior, Lord, uh, lover of our souls, Father God, Lord, just all that you are, you dwell in unapproachable light, and yet you're knowable, Lord. So we ask that you would reveal yourself to us in ways that you've never revealed yourself to us before. Speak to us from the borders of another world, Lord. Bring the atmosphere of heaven to this room. By the power of your spirit, take the things that belong to you and reveal them to each one of our hearts, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, let's just read the first 10 verses, and then we'll, we'll go back over them. These words spake Jesus, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and, thou, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which you gave me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. So... As we've been traveling through uh, the Gospel of John, we see the Gospels basically divided into two parts. Chapters 1 through 12, John introduces Jesus as, as deity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and pitched his tent amongst us. And then he says a profound statement, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten, the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And that this Messiah, this, this God-man came into the world, he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. So chapters 1 through 12, he's presenting himself to the Jews and the world as the Messiah uh, of Israel. He came unto his own, they didn't receive him. Then it says, to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become children of God. So the disciples and all those who received his word, he's now he's saying, I'm going to be glorified in them, in the church that he's going to build. So chapters 1 through 12, he's been introducing himself to the world as the Messiah. Chapters 13 on, specifically 13 through 16, he starts to preach, present himself and preach and teach to his own disciples the night before his crucifixion. He starts to tell them personal Things that they're going to need when he goes away. Chapters 13 through 16. Uh, chapter 13, you can even break that down even further. He is our advocate. Chapter 13. Uh, he presents himself to them as the advocate, washing their feet as they walk in this world, that we need that constant cleansing. Chapter uh, 14, he's our coming king, our hope, our future. I've prepared a place for you. I'll come back and I'll receive you again unto myself. So our destiny, our home is with him in heaven. Chapter 15, he's the living vine. We're the branches. We have to abide in him to produce fruit in our world. Chapter 16, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to empower you with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to fill you with my spirit so that you can perform the works that I've foreordained already ready for you in this world to walk in so so we can stand strong for him in a hostile world now we come to chapter 17 and he's going to be start to be seen as our high priest in heaven we actually get to enter into the mind of god now a lot of people you know christianity kind of takes a 
a, 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 a hit today because so many people just think you have one experience with God, you get saved, and then that's it. It's very shallow Christianity. It's not this relationship. Well, the Bible teaches us who God is for a reason. You know, the difficult things, he's going to show us his mind, the mind of, of God, what his plans for mankind are, his glory, how much he loves us. He's going to let us in on the things of the Godhead, which can't be understood only by those people who were born again. We should have a good theology. What I mean is theology, what else better is there to study but God? To get to know God better. How do we know him? We know him in what he says about himself and what he reveals to us through Jesus, the life of Jesus, the words of Jesus, how he met people, how he talked to them, his disciples, all the things that he said about the Father. Because basically he's going to show us the Father. He's going to show us who God is. And we're going to know God. And we're going to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength if we have a basic understanding of who he is. And that's what he's going to do here. We actually get to enter into the mind of God to see his plan and to appreciate what he's accomplished for us. Do you appreciate what God's done for you? Like children, when they're very young, they have no idea what you're doing for them, right? You, you, you're paying for all their braces and their things. As they grow up, they get older, they start to appreciate it more. Then you make them get a job so they understand what money really is all about. And then they start to say, wow, man, mom and dad were really nice to me. That's how our walk with God should be. We get in as children. We have, we, we have to believe like a child. We want childlike faith. But we also want to get to know our father better so we can appreciate all that he's done for us and see the depths of his love for us. That's what he's going to do here and show us as we see what Jesus says in these 10 verses. So as we go on with our, our relationship with Jesus, we should appreciate him more. Here Jesus lets us in on the plan of God from the beginning of the world, a plan that was in place before God ever said, let there be light or laid the foundation of the world or creator God. Just imagine that, this being that dwells in unapproachable light that created everything. Before he created it, he's, he already had a plan. He already loved you and he already had a way to redeem mankind. He knew what was gonna happen. The pressure that Jesus is feeling right now before the cross is enormous. Everything hinges on the accomplishment of the cross and the resurrection for mankind, for this world that God created. Now, this is the Lord's prayer. The Lord is praying to the Father. This is not the disciples' prayer. Je Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, forgive us our trespasses. Jesus never committed a trespass. He never, he never committed a sin. He never had to say, Father, forgive me. You know, I've done something wrong. The prayer he taught his disciples to pray when they asked to teach us to pray was, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus here, he, you know, when he prayed that, he prayed for the people around him, not with them because he's perfect. Now Jesus is going to show us his relationship to God in a way that's so familiar, that spans eternity past. What is incredible about this communion in the Godhead is the value that he places on human beings. The value that God places on us in his counsel is amazing to me. The fact that he loves us so. The fact that he went through all that he went through to win us and to make us his own. So that he could have communion with us. Humanity. How much does God love humanity? This prayer shows the value of man to God. I mean, in theology, how, how, how much does man mean to God? Does he care for us? Is he just out there, set the whole thing in motion, he's a deist and said, let it roll on, I don't care about people. So many people have a complaint with God. God doesn't care, look what's going on in the world, I've suffered this, I've suffered that, I've lost this, I've lost that. There's pain in this world, there's sin in this world, and mankind brought this mortal sorrow upon us, and God already had a plan in place to relieve us of this mortal, mortal sorrow that we experience, and to give us eternal life with him in glory and to behold his glory, the wonder of it. So this chapter is for the spiritual man. It's for the spiritual man or woman. It reveals the mind of the Messiah and God. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says this, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We're given the ability to understand these things. Let's jump in. Verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. So 
Evidently, Jesus stops talking to his disciples, lifts up his eyes to heaven, and he starts to pray. His focus is on the eternal. His focus is on the reality of, of what's really real. Our focus so much when we pray is on the temporary. I need this, I need this here. When our focus should be on the eternal and our home with him in heaven. The hour is come. All throughout the gospel, Jesus has said, my hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. Now he says, my hour is come. So this is the hour. This is the hour of all hours, the time toward which everything in time and eternity has been fixed, has been heading toward. The hour has come for God to be glorified, for God to gain glory. What is glory? You look up the definition. Glory is either uh, magnificence, wonder, but it also is an attaining of glory through, through marvelous deeds, Many men say, oh, I, I, what do you want? Well, I want to attain glory on the battlefield, you know. I want to, to be brave, and, and, and that will get me glory. People will look up for the deeds that I have done, and I will have this glory. People obtain glory through athletics. You know, you see like a great comeback or something, and there's a glory in that. There's a rejoicing at the end of the game when we came back from almost nothing. The idea is this is a creator God gaining glory by winning us, by winning back his creation by settling the sin question on earth how is the, the hour has come for god to be glorified in the messiah by settling the sin question the hour has come for god with no help from mankind mankind can't do anything about this we are dead in trespasses and sins we're totally depraved we can't win the day only jesus can win the day here only he can redeem mankind only he can go to this hour to pay for man in full in fact in the Bible, everything that's written from Genesis chapter 3.15 on is about the coming of a redeemer to, to, to redeem, to restore the fallen race and to bring fellowship back with God. That mankind was cut off and death has come upon all men because we've all sinned. We've sided with an evil cherub in an invisible realm who's usurped the power over this earth and took it from Adam. And God had a problem. God was cut off from mankind. We had no peace with God. We were at enmity with God. We were sinners. Death has come upon the whole race because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God had an hour in place before that ever occurred because he loved mankind so much and he wants to fellowship us with us that he's going to gain glory in what the Messiah is going to do. It's going to be so renowned and it's going to be so awesome that in the ages to come, we're going to be looking into what Jesus Christ did in this hour for mankind. The angels desire to look into the things that pertain to the heirs of salvation because of what God has done for mankind. This hour was in the heart of God before he ever created anything. So redemption itself is a God thing. Man has nothing to do with it. We can't add to it. We can't subtract from it. We can't earn it. We can't do anything. This is the hour that God has come to glorify himself in Jesus and glorify the Father by, by sending Jesus for us. So God's glory is literally attached to the human race, to human beings being saved. Sinful human beings being brought to heaven brings God glory. Man being able to look on God once again, the tabernacle of God being with men. So you might ask yourself, what do you want from God? Much of the church today, I have to say, it is, it is superficial and fleshly. We want things, we want carnal things from God. Do you want to see his glory, the glory, the joy that is set before us to be with God, to walk with God, to see the creator of all things, to know him intimately? Moses, when Moses, Moses talked to God. Moses had a relationship with God. If you read the Old Testament, you're almost jealous. God talked to Moses. He would just appear and talk to Moses. Now, Moses could never see his glory. He got communication with God. He saw miracles. He parted the Red Sea. But the one thing he really wanted to see, because he knew behind it all, the wonder of it, the one thing that we all really desire is to be safe is to be in a presence that is so powerful and mighty and so filled with glory and so filled with precious promises fulfilled and he's gained glory and so trustworthy that we feel utterly safe and secure in the glory of God. 
in his presence. That's what Moses longed for. Show me your glory. I want to feel that. I want to be next to that. I want to see you in all your beauty and all your splendor. Show me was his plea. He saw miracles. He saw miracle food every day, but he wanted to see God's glory. And God said, look, you can't see me and live. I'll let you see my my rear glow, my afterglow. I'll, I'll go past you and you can just see the afterglow. But you can't see my, me and live in the state that you're in. Now the time has come for God to glorify himself and to take action on man's behalf because we were hopelessly lost unless he acts, unless God acts. Revelation 13, 8 says this, the plan was in God's heart all along. The Bible tells you it was in eternity past, eternity future, and, et- and present et- eternity. Revelation 13, 8 says the lamb was slain from the foundation of the earth. It says it, in the new Jerusalem was come down out of heaven and I will write upon him my new name, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the lamb was slain in eternity past. It was already settled in God's heart and settled in the Godhead. Matthew 25, 34 talks about eternity future. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So the glory of God's kingdom is attached to us and is prepared for us and eternity future includes us because of what Jesus Christ, the glory that God's going to attain in winning a bride out of this fallen world is going to shine for eternity. The present, what about the present? Luke 12, 32, Jesus says this to his own disciples. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So while we live in this world and we see the difficulties, fear not, little flock. It's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You're bought with a price. Your life is not your own. So God takes delight in to offer us a kingdom that he paid the ultimate price to obtain. So how valuable are we to God? How valuable are we to God? To, to him, that he would do this for us. And why? Why would this incredible God do this for us? And why don't we appreciate it enough? The creator of all things, think of a being that always was and always is. Doesn't need anything to exist. He will always be omnipotent, all-powerful. Who are we that he sets his affections upon us? In fact, the psalmist says this, and I think it's important, um, as Tony loves to sing the Psalms, and I, I love worship when he does those, and I love all the worship that he does, but I specifically love the Psalms. When I consider the, the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, you go look outside, you're blown away by creation. And then you think of how puny you are, what, what is man, and we're growing old, getting weaker, that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that visited him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. God's going to give us his glory and his honor. So God's plan for man and love for man exceeds anything that we can understand or comprehend. The angels have a hard time looking into it. 1 Peter 1.12 says they desire to look into things that pertain to the heirs of salvation. So the mystery of God taking on flesh and redeeming a sinning race, they can hardly fathom the indescribable God who they worship. I mean, think of it. Jesus said God is spirit, and he dwells in unapproachable light. He stoops down like this and makes himself a man. The unknowable God becomes knowable in Jesus. How much does God love us? Look at Jesus on the cross reconciling the world to himself. What's the gospel? What's the good news? All for the joy that was set before him, the glory that he would win, the glory that he would attain, and heaven filled with sinful human beings worshiping him, throwing their crowns at his feet and seeing. That's that's ahead of him. He says, I want them to see me in my glory. His hour has come. The plan will be actualized now in time and eternity. There is no doubt that God will be glorified in Jesus. Verses 2 and 3. 
wonderful verses for the security of the believer, the sovereignty of God. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So the Father knows how many Jesus is going to obtain and be given. That's sovereignty of God right there. You can't escape it. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So life eternal is knowing the true God, and that is through Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So a couple things here that you want to notice off the bat. Power over all flesh has been given to Jesus, which tells you a lot. Only God could say that, but Jesus is saying that. Jesus has said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Jesus says that he literally gives eternal life to as many as God has given him. So there's no way anyone can read this and say Jesus is not God. He claims to be, be the Messiah himself, the Christ, the anointed. He says he has power over all flesh and he has authority over all flesh. And he's the only one that can give you eternal life. Which tells you there is no other way to the Father but through Jesus. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other. There, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, because he is God and he can give eternal life to all those that come unto God by him, Hebrews 7.25 says this, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he, Jesus, ever lives to make intercession for them. So there's only one God and one Savior, and that is Jesus, a name above all names. Verse 2, look at it closely. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. As many as thou hast given him. So there is a sovereign aspect to where the Holy Spirit goes into the world, convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And God knows who's going to respond to that. And those who respond are sovereignly, like, like Abraham was sovereignly chosen by God to start the Jewish people. You were sovereignly sought out by God to receive this gift and to become Jesus, Jesus' bride, to become his, his child, to become God's children. So God looks at human beings as gifts. We're a gift to Jesus. And then Jesus gives eternal life to all that the Father gives him. Now, how many does the Father give, you might ask? Well, well, how do I know I'm given? John 6, 37, Jesus says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. How do you know you've been given? Because you've come to Jesus. It's as simple as that. If you know Jesus, that means God was working in your life. He drew you. You were dead in trespasses and sins. He sought you out. You, you placed saving faith in Jesus. God knew that was going to happen in eternity past, and you were already sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise in some wonderful, remarkable way. When we get to heaven, we're going to look back and see that we were chosen from the foundation of the world. What a wonderful thing. And then he says this, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So he tells you all you have to do is come and believe, and then you've been chosen in some remarkable way. So simple as this. This is the best I can explain it to you because people argue over the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. While we're on this earth, the Bible has many verses that talk about choosing. The Bible has many verses that talk about God has elected us. So they're both true. To tell you the truth, while we're here on earth, we're told to go preach the gospel so that men might choose, and God's not willing that any perish but all should come to repentance, right? That's our job as believers, to go spread the good news of Jesus Christ, and God will add to the church daily such as should be saved. And he knows. He knows his sheep, they're going to hear him, and they're going to respond. And God's going to give them that saving faith. So, in one verse, it's simple. It tells you, all that the Father gives me will come to me. That's John 6, 37. Have you come to Jesus? Then you're God's gift to him. Well, I don't like that, Pastor. I, I, I came to Jesus. I'm not sure if he drew me. Well, it says, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So come, and you've been given. Choose, and you've been chosen. I don't like that. Don't choose, and you haven't been chosen. I don't like that. So choose, and you've been chosen. That's all I can tell you about the whole matter. There's smarter people than me that argue about it. I like the one thing, as somebody sent me a video about the idea that 
on the front of the door into heaven is, come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. You know, choose to stay whom you will serve. All the verses that tell us, God's not willing any parish, all should come to repentance. And then on the other side of the door, it says, chosen from the foundation of the earth. See, what you're doing is you're peering into the mind of the eternal. And you're knowing that this, this, this Father in heaven has eternally knew you. And it's hard for you to comprehend because you were born into a temporary world. You think you made a choice at a certain point in time. God saw all those choices before you were ever born. And Jesus was already in place as your propitiation and your forgiveness before you ever even took a breath. God knew you in the womb before you even knit together in the womb, the Bible says. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. God is intimately aware of every one of his creatures to the fact that a, a, a bird doesn't fall out of a nest without him knowing about it. And a hair is not numbered on your head. And you're worth more than many birds and anything to God. You're worth so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. So if you don't know Jesus, then today you have an opportunity to let the Holy Spirit speak to you and you can choose a life that you may live. And then you can find out in the long run that God chose you all along and you were his child. Wonderful security of the believer. Verse 3, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So eternal life is what? Is to know God and the Messiah who he sent to redeem you. It's as simple as that. That is life that will last forever and will be forever growing. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also, John, chap, same chapter, that they, they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 2, 7. It's another great verse, that in the ages to come, he might reveal the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. So we're going to appreciate this more and more the closer we get to the Lord and the closer we get to heaven as a child learns to appreciate their father. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So Jesus had one mission, and that was to glorify God to exegete the eternal, the word made flesh. Now remember, he never did anything wrong. He was perfect, always led a pleasing life. God would say out loud, this is my beloved son in whom I am already well pleased. Never did a miracle, only worked in a carpenter's shop when he was baptized. Well, we, we don't know how many miracles he might have done when he was a kid, but all we know is that he was in obscurity. He didn't start a ministry. He didn't preach didn't really preach a sermon, didn't collect his disciples yet, and God said, I'm already well pleased, already lived a perfect life. Never had to confess a sin, never wept over his own sin, but he wept over the sin of mankind. He wept over death, he wept over Lazarus. And then he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the very righteousness of God. Father, I've completed the work that you sent me to do. I'm the only one that could do it. He hasn't even gone to the cross yet, and he's fully assured of his victory. He's already completed it. In his mind, it's already a done deal. He's already suffered through the cross, the three hours of darkness, and his, I've completed the work that you've given me to do. And it was all about God's glory so that we could become the very righteousness of God. Jesus would become sin. I finished the work that thou gavest me to do. Think about that. The time that he really finishes that work is when he hangs his head and he gives up the ghost. He says to Telestai, paid in full. And it's interesting, Jesus said while he was on this earth, he said, foxes have holes, the birds of the air. Everybody's at home here. Even the foxes have their little dens and the birds of the air have their nests. God takes care of them. But I have no place to lay my head. I'm not comfortable on this earth. This is, this, my, my kingdom is not of this world. And it wasn't until he breathed his last and he breathed his, his breath out and he was totally pulverized and beaten beyond human recognition. And he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he let out that breath and he hung his head. That was the only time that he ever rested. He will go to the cross and say, to tell us die, it's finished, it's accomplished, it's paid in full. What a wonderful work that Christ has done on our behalf. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we're going to see that. He's going to sweat great drops of blood and say, Father, if there's any other way that this can be done, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but your will be done. And the will of God and God's will 
was for Jesus to gain the glory by becoming a sin offering for mankind and finishing the work that he was sent here to do for us. And he could only do it alone. you got to understand, you want glory? Glory is, the, is, is what Jesus did. It is, the most, it is the most heroic act ever on the face of the planet. A sinless, innocent person. In fact, just somebody that could live this life sinlessly is the greatest heroic act ever. But yet to take that life and that communion and the Godhead and somehow put it all in flesh and then have God withdraw from this perfect, perfect man, this perfect creator God, man, and have all the sin of the world, your sin and my sin, fall upon him. God turn his back and Satan and the invisible realm throw everything they have at Jesus and Jesus bears it all until his heart bursts. His heart bursts with the agony of it all. And then he hangs his head and in that act, our sin, all the things that we've done wrong was paid for in full. It's an amazing glorifying thing. And, I, and I, I can't think of anything more wonderful than that. Everything we set our hand to must be done for his honor and glory because of what he's done for us. God will, and, and, and God's glory was the key to finishing the work. Jesus wanted to glorify God. Jesus was the only one who could say he finished the work. He's the only redeemer. We carry on his finished work. Think about it. We have a work to carry on and a message of the heroics of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're all able ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Show people that glory, what he's done for us. Do you want to know why so many fail in ministry? There's something that comes ahead of God's glory for them. Their own glory. Their own, their own ministry. Their own buildings that they're building. Instead of God's glory, it's now become man's thing. Now we, you know, we, we walk up to God. I read another wonderful article where it says, so much of Christianity is Jesus walking up with his hat in his hand toward us saying, hey, receive me. No, we should be walking with our hat in our hands and our face on the ground saying, Lord, receive me for what you've done for me. Apply your gift to my life. Everything we set our hand to must be done for him and his honor and his glory. And God's glory is eternal. Man's glory is temporary. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. That's what having the mind of Christ is all about. That's what looking into these things is all about. You can gaze into these things all day and still not comprehend the wonder and the glory of our God. That's how wonderful he is. That's what our motivation is. Let me read Philippians for you. I think it's important, and it's something that we need to continually remember. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We need to have that mind in us. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, as Jesus is praying, he's already accomplished his work and the cross is still hours away in his heart. There's no doubt as to his ultimate victory. And he doesn't doubt his destiny at all. Although everything's going to be thrown at him except the kitchen sink and all of his friends are going to run away. He's, he has no doubt he can handle it because God's going to be with him. And he's still going to be able to handle those three hours of darkness when he's all alone. And the Godhead is fractured in some way, which is when we get to that, I'm going to have a hard time comprehending that. So if there's no doubt to his victory, is there any doubt to our victory? Do you sometimes doubt your destiny? If God went through all that to win you, do you doubt that what he's applied to your life will last forever? Can anyone doubt the eternal security of God's elect, of God's, of God's chosen ones, of those who've believed? 
The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The work is secured. I don't have to earn it. I just have to believe in it and trust in it and yield to my Lord and Savior and watch his life flow through me as the vine. I'm just a branch in it. Verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. This is a great verse claiming the deity of Jesus and preexistence. It's, it's a great verse to take a Jehovah's Witness to and then take him to Isaiah 42.8 and, and ask him this question. God speaking here, I am the Lord. Whenever you get capital L-O-R-D in the Bible, that means Yahweh. I am Yahweh. That is my name and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So if Jehovah or Yahweh, whom the Jehovah's Witnesses say they worship, and Jesus is just an angel, why is this God who said he won't share his glory with anyone else, angel or anybody else, He's not sharing it with Satan. He's not sharing it with an angel. Why is he sharing it with Jesus? Because Jesus is God. It's as simple as that. These few verses here, you know, it's interesting. Verse 5 tells us of, of, of all the verses in the beginning. Verse 1 tells us of Jesus' acquired glory. Jesus had glory in the past. He didn't need, he didn't need any more glory. He, he could have stayed in heaven and been worshipped. But he acquired more fame and glory by emptying himself and becoming a man. He acquired glory by gaining men for himself, by gaining a bride. And he says, glorify thy son that thy son may also glorify. They were already glorified in heaven, but the work that Jesus is going to do is going to glorify God even further. And it's going to glorify Jesus, his son whom he sent. And he's acquired that glory by coming to this earth and winning us. We share in that glory. We're part of God's glory. God looks at us and, and, and we show forth his glory in ages to come by the mercy and the grace that he's shown towards us. It's going to prove how wonderful loving God is. And you here you have his essential glory. In this verse, this is the glory that he already had, that he alone is God. There's only one God and only one judge and only one Savior, and that's Jesus. And they've been there from the beginning. He says, look, glorify thou me with, the, with thine own self. We had glory before we ever even started this world. So we can never become part. There's only one God and Savior, that's Jesus. And we can never become part of the Godhead. He remains alone. That was there before we ever even entered the picture. He, was, he always was, is, and will be. So his glory is eternal. We are created. We add to his glory because of what God's done. God never became an angel and redeemed any angels that sin. In fact, there's a war in heaven, and angels have rebelled against God. There's no propitiation. There's no savior for them. God didn't gain any glory by going and winning them. They're going to suffer their own eternal torment for the choices that they make. They don't have a redeemer. We, on the other hand, sided with them. Stupid, we're lower than the angels. And they look down on us, those fallen angels do. But God gained glory in that he found a way, and he already knew about a way, that he would become one of us. He would literally enter into fleshly existence and become a human being and take that DNA straight to the power on high, this invisible God that dwells in eternity that created everything, and he would literally express the glory of God, and that glory would be expressed through human DNA for eternity. That in itself is amazing. Not only that, he takes us along because he's a fire leader, and he carries us along with him because of what he's done, and we're going to sing Praise your name forever and ever. We're going to sing hallelujah and throw our crowns because the glory is going to be overwhelming when we get there. What a wonderful thing. The glory of God. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gave me. I, I, I showed who you are, Father God, to the men which you gave me out of this world. The disciples and the people that have followed him, the hundreds that were following him, the thousands. Many walked away in John chapter 6, verse 66, if you remember. He says, thine they were, they were already yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept thy word. So Jesus now starts to pray for his disciples. He's going to pray for us too. He's going to pray for those who are going to believe on the disciples' testimony. That's us. So it's wonderful. This, this whole chapter, the movement of the whole chapter is wonderful. So it's not just the 12 
that believe, but anybody who, 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 who carries on his message. And the men to carry on his message and those who believe, not just the 12, but to all those that believe on their testimony. So he manifested the name of God. Glorify man. I have manifested thy own nama. How, you know, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld this glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. How did he manifest God uh, to them? How did, how, how, you know, who did he manifest God to? To the men who, who God gave him. Now, the Bible says this, no man can come except the Father draweth them. Jesus said that. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. He just, just, just said, you know, in, in, in so many ways, he just said that again. So if you've come to Jesus, then you've been drawn by Jesus. He set his affections on you. And then he manifests his grace and his truth equally in your life. And we should too. He says he was full of grace and truth. And I think that's where a lot of us go wrong, man. We need to be more like Jesus, full of grace and also full of truth. People that are full of grace and no truth, there's love or there's, there, there's permissiveness and there's liberality and there's, there's, there's no condemnation of sin and it's easy believism and no, a salvation with no real repentance added to it. And then when there's truth with no love, all that is is Phariseeism, is, is legalism and a trying to earn salvation. You got to have them equally. You got to understand, grace is what keeps us. We're never going to be perfect under the law, but we still realize truth is a, a, a huge element of what we believe. And we want to guide our lives into truth. And we want to be righteous because he is righteous. We want to come out from among them and be separate. So we ask the Lord to change us and to move us. And every time we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That's Jesus Christ, our advocate. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you need grace and you need truth. If you have a church too filled with truth, you have a legalistic uh, interpretation of the Bible and you have people trying to earn their way to heaven. If you have a church that has all grace and no Bible, no truth, what you have is liberalism and sin and a lot of people who think they're saved but practice iniquity. You need to be filled with grace and truth. And he manifested both to those to his disciples. Verses 7 and 8. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. They understand that everything I do and everything I've done was given me from you. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. Jesus said, I don't go do or say anything unless God tells me to do it. Everything Jesus said, he got straight from the Father. He's saying, I didn't do anything original here. Everything I'm saying was specifically designed for me to tell you, and you're going to be held accountable to it. When I speak, God is speaking through me, and I have not deviated from that message at all, which is pretty incredible. For I've given them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So, verses 7 and 8, these are great verses to check to see whether you're a believer or not. How do you know if you truly believe, if you're in the faith? Well, number one, did you receive the words of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that Jesus Christ has the words of eternal life? Do you believe that he came out from God and returned to God? Those are important things. All of God's things are Jesus' things. Do you believe that, that they are one? Do you believe in the deity of Jesus? His words are God's words, most important. Uh, many can't receive that. Can you? Are there many paths or ideas to God? Not according to Jesus here. His words are the only words that God has spoken to mankind. How important is the word of the Lord to you? Verses 9 and 10, and we'll close. I pray for them, and I, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. He says, I'm not praying for the whole entire world of people. And right now, I'm praying for the ones that are going to believe in me. For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. So he prays for his own. One day he's going to make a request. It says in Psalm um, chapter 2, ask of me and I'll give thee the, the heathen for thy inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth thy possession. One day he's going to own the whole world. But here he's simply praying for those of us who are in this fallen world. He's praying for us. He's going to pray for strength for us. We belong to God. We belong to Jesus. All mine are thine and thine are mine. So we belong to both. He prays for his own. So what security we have in Christ. 
Um, he says something very similar in John chapter 10, and I'm going to read that for you. John chapter 10, verse 27. I think it's important because I think in these times that we're in, I think it's important that you sit still for a while and listen and see if you can hear the voice of your Lord speaking to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I recognize them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. It's hard sometimes for me to believe that God's going to be glorified in me. You know, I look at my life, and it, 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 you know, there's many, many, many things I wish I could do over. And the older we get, I think the more we do overs we want. You know, we look back like, I would have done that, I should have done that, I should have done that. And we can live in, in a state of, of regret and, underst and not understanding the grace that God has for us. It's hard for us to imagine. We think we're just going to barely get saved and God's going to let us in because he has to from what Jesus Christ has done. No, it's God's glory. It's, 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 it's his pleasure to give us the kingdom. He wants us to be there. It's only by his grace and by his love that we get to participate. We're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, and, and God is glorified in it. What a deal. What a deal. You know what I mean? You think about, well, that's a deal. It's the deal. And that's hard for us sometimes to imagine and grow. And the older we get, the more sin we accumulate, the more times we have to ask for forgiveness and confess our sins, the more, the more sinful we see ourselves and we say to ourselves, man, God's not getting a great deal. Let me tell you something. If God didn't spare his own son and offered him up for us freely, and what Jesus is talking about right here, he's going to gain glory in us. You can guarantee that he's going to finish the work that he started in your life. All we have to do is yield. All we have to do is abide in the vine. All we have to do is thank him and love him and show forth his glory to other people, his magnificence, his wonder. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you for, for this word, Lord, and I thank you for your, your love for us, Lord. It's just amazing to me as I look at it, Lord. It just, it just blows my mind, Lord. It's hard for me to, to articulate it, Lord. I thank you um, for your spirit who searches the deep things of you, Lord, and reveals it unto us in our quiet times, Lord, with you. I pray, Lord, that there's anyone out there that does not know you that wants to know you, Lord. I pray that you would manifest your glory to them even now that you would draw them by the power of your spirit to your side, Jesus. You let them know that your love and affection has been set upon them before they were ever born and bring them into the fold. Father, we, 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 we love you for loving us first, Lord. And Lord, we, we know that those who call upon your name, you will no wise cast out. So I pray that anyone out there, Lord, that they would just reach out and take that step of faith, whether it's small, whether they're young and they've never done it. Maybe they live in a Christian home all their life and never really did it, Lord. Never really said, you know, I, I want you to be my Savior. Lord, I pray for those right now, Lord, that they would see you reaching out to them and then they would reach back, Lord. And in a more remarkable way, they would become born again by your Spirit and sealed with your Holy Spirit of promise. We pray for all of us who, who believe in you, Lord, who have made a profession of faith. Lord, we want to grow in that grace and that knowledge of who you are. We ask that that would happen today, Lord. Show us your glory in more remarkable ways than ever, Lord. We give our heart and our lives afresh to you. We ask for a fresh filling of your spirit. We thank you for all you're doing, Lord. We look forward to meeting again. I know um, these doors are going to open soon, Lord. And Lord, when they do, Lord, we long to take communion, Lord and to set things right in all of our hearts, Lord. We should be doing that right now anyway, Lord. But Lord, just prepare our hearts for what you have for us when we return. Lord, we want an in-gathering, Lord, before you return for us, Lord. And if not, you can come. We're not, um, come right now, Lord Jesus, we, we pray. But Lord, we also look for a revival in our hearts and in this land. Lord, we look for, for one more outpouring of your spirit and a great awakening, Lord. Lord, do these things, we pray, not because of who we are, but because of your great name, and gather glory, Lord, from amongst this world. Take out sinners, Lord. Get glory for your name, Lord, and use us any way that you want, we pray in your name. Amen.